All right, well, a very warm welcome to the opening today of the Centre for Applied History here at Macquarie University. We're really pleased that all of you uh, could come here today to be part of this celebration. We have very high hopes for the Centre. It's very much the brainchild of Tanya here from Modern History, but supported by other departments in the faculty, uh, Ancient History and Music and um, Media and Cultural Studies as well. Um, we're very fortunate today to have the Dean of the Faculty with us, Marti Professor Martina Mollering, who is going to come up to the lectern and formally uh, launch the centre. Thank you very much for being here, Martina. We know Martina is a very, very busy Dean. She's very supportive of the centre and in its setting up. So, uh, a welcome to the Dean. Thanks, Martina. Thanks, Peter. And it's a pleasure to be here. These, these are the pleasurable things to be doing within the Faculty such as the vibrant one that we are in. So good afternoon everyone from me and from the faculty overall and thank you very much for being here. I would like to thank Tanya for inviting me to help launch the centre. As I said, this is one of the pleasurable events in the faculty and particularly so as the initiative is coming from the Department of Modern History, Politics and International Relations. But there is collaboration with colleagues in Ancient History and Peter just introduced us. Um, as well as MMCCS, Music, Media and Cultural Studies in the Faculty of Arts. The primary aim of the Centre is to highlight the role of historical knowledge in shaping public policy and the uses of history in the development of key institutions and within diverse communities. So it's quite a broad reach that the Centre is proposing. At a time when government and policy formation is under increased scrutiny and challenge, this historically informed perspective on contemporary public policy issues has great value and significance <coughs> promoting greater awareness of the context of current decision making and highlighting the vital role that long-standing social and industrial organizations play in advocating community welfare and inclusive policy outcomes. So a way of bringing the research that's undertaken in the different departments I mentioned earlier into an applied context and having an impact beyond the reach of the university. Not only will the Centre help to build linkages with community and industry partners by exploring the production and consumption of history outside the universities. I find the term consumption of history an interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> you might want to have a discussion about how you consume history. <laughs> it will also draw upon Macquarie University's nationally and internationally recognised research and teaching strengths in the field of applied history. And that for Macquarie includes family history, digital history and e-research, cultural heritage, museums, and you would be aware that currently we have two of them, hopefully sort of coming closer together in the future with our plans for what we're doing with the Faculty of Arts. And oral history, consultancy work, history and policy, television, radio, community, regional and local history. So again, you can see the broad span of what is proposed to be undertaken by the Centre. I must say that I look forward to see the exciting developments in teaching, research, but also public debate that will be emanating from the centre. And I would like to extend my congratulations to Tanya as the director of the centre, but also to Macquarie's other participating historians. And so I won't forget, I'll have my list in front of me, and if I do forget somebody, do come to me afterwards and tell me that you're not on the list. Professor Sean Brawley, Associate Professor Sean Ross, Associate Professor Michelle Arrow, Dr. Mark Hearn, and Dr. Alison Holland. And I'm sure this will generate further interest and will bring in, I can see already, MRES students, PhD students here today. So I think this is the beginning, this is the kernel. And I wish you success in your undertakings and a very successful launch for the rest of the afternoon. I would love to be staying for the presentations, but I'm sorry, I have to go to a council meeting later this afternoon. <laughs> so I can't engage with history in this forum this afternoon. Hope to be able to join you later on. So thank you very much for having me here and thank good you luck to you. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> Before we go, Martina, thank you very much for the faculty support at the centre as well. Thank you. Um, so um, today's event is an informal event. It's really just to showcase uh, some of the work that the centre is doing to introduce you to the team that uh, Martina has already mentioned, but there are others involved. So you will meet some of our external stakeholders and partners who we have long-term collaborations with. Um, and what we're going to do is talk about, after the panel discussion, some of the projects that we're engaged in over the coming months. But we want this to be uh, a moment when you come to us with your ideas as well, so that we can think about all the diverse ways in which we can collaborate on research and teaching and community engagement in the future. So thanks very much for all coming today.
And now it's time for our panel discussion. Thank you very much, Tanya. Yes, and I would also say in particular, Tanya has just put so much work into this. She has a wonderful energy, as I'm sure many of you are aware, but she's put a lot of work into this and we're all very grateful to her for that. Um, we have, of course, the panel discussion that Tanya has just referred to and that the Dean has referred to as well. We have with us uh, Dr. Lisa Murray, who is the uh, City Historian uh, and heads up the History Unit at the uh, City of Sydney Council. Lisa will speak um, first on the topic of applied history in Australia. Um, Lisa oversees a diverse history program at the City that encompasses local and community history, civic and municipal history and urban history. And with over 15 years experience in the field of public history, Lisa is passionate about making history accessible to the public. Uh, she is the award-winning author of Planning Histories and a regular contributor to debates around public history, including being a speaker at uh, TEDx Sydney in 2013. So, Lisa, I'll uh, ask you if you'd like to come up now um, as part of the panel. Um, Paul Ashton, uh, Professor Paul Ashton, uh, was a professor of public history at UTS for many years and uh, now holds an honorary appointment here at Macquarie. He was co-director of the Australian Centre for Public History uh, and Centre for Creative Practice and Cultural Economy for many years. He is also founding co-editor of the journal Public History Review. So thank you very much for being here too, Paul. And Paula Hamilton was also co-director of the Australian Centre for Public History with Paul Ashton at UTS and now holds an honorary appointment here at Macquarie. She has conducted consultancies and research with museums including the Powerhouse, Australian Museum and the National Museum of Australia. She has strong links with the oral history community the oral history community, I'm sorry, indicative of her long-term interest in cultural memory, particularly collective uh, memory, uh, remembering through oral narratives. She remains committed to facilitating historical work for wider audiences and promoting links between um, academia and the public sphere. And Paula will talk to us on the topic of who is a public historian. I forgot to mention that Paul will speak on the topic of applied history around the world. So could I ask the panel now to come forward? And we look forward very much to, um, to hearing what you have to say. As uh, Tanya says, this is meant to be quite an informal afternoon. We really hope that a lot of you afterwards can stay and mingle and have discussions. And that's a lot of what the centre will be about, about the university reaching very much out into the world outside of the university, as it were, where a lot of history is being done, a lot of really important history is being done, and making conduits into the university world as well. We're very keen on that being... Uh, an important element of the way that the, um, that the centre operates. Okay, thank you. Lisa. Can we, can, we turn, can we turn that off? Yes, Sorry, we can. Right. We can. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Tanya, for inviting me on today, and it's great to be here on a panel with Paul and Paula. Um, I went to the Art Gallery of New South Wales on the weekend and immersed myself in the video installation by renowned German, German artist Julian Rosefeld. It was called Manifesto and the films feature Kate Blanchett in a series of um, roles in a variety of everyday and quite surreal um, scenes, reciting capitalist and art manifestos from the modern era and putting them, I guess, into a different context. It was extremely provocative and thoughtful artwork. And after the experience and reflecting upon preparing for today's talk, I, there was a moment when I felt that nothing less than a manifesto of applied history was appropriate. <laughs> but I didn't want to go on a rant. And my vision is not nearly as poetic as Julian Roosevelt's or those of the many other writers and philosophers. And in any case, Joe Goldie and David Armitage have already published the History Manifesto a couple of years ago. Yeah. And I'm not going to read you that. There's not enough time. I've only got five minutes. So you're off the hook in that regard. But my words are unapologetically aspirational. And I hope they give some sense of the possibilities of what applied history is and can do here in Australia. I am a practitioner, and so I guess I have a very particular take on applied history. 
through my work in local government, I apply my historical knowledge and the principles of historical research and analysis to a variety of business, governance, community and interpretation scenarios. Companies, institutions and governments that recognise their history and apply it to their business decisions are smart organisations. History is a foundation for effective governance and it can be a catalyst for policy reform. I concur entirely with the motto which is published on the History Teacher Association, New South Wales mug. No history, no future. I drink tea from this every day in the office and it is a valuable reminder to myself and to other people around the office of my role as a historian in a local government organisation. Historical research, content and precedence provide guidance and add value to corporate decision making. History can also contribute to effective service provision, program development, innovation and creativity. When the lens of history is applied to everyday life, perceptions can change. A better understanding of our history can enhance the community's sense of identity, place and belonging. A connected community is a social indicator of well-being and it helps to build community capacity and resilience to change. This social capital and resilience is vital in our fast-paced and ever-changing world. History supports and enhances our vibrant local communities. It provides accessible community level social infrastructure and opportunities for lifelong learning. The legislative heritage system in Australia leans heavily upon history for its legitimacy and history is a cornerstone of heritage significance assessments. Without history, there would be no heritage in this country. History feeds into planning, policy, legal cases, heritage listings and placemaking that embraces our heritage and material culture. My main objective as a public historian is to apply and share historical knowledge and connect audiences to Sydney's history via events, digital content and storytelling and interventions in the public domain and built environment. It is all about public consumption and the city is my canvas. Applied history can be found and, in, and is practiced in many other places around Australia. Museums and galleries, all forms of the media, audio, print, film, online and social, and through family history organisations, heritage friends groups, as well as the arts and cultural expression. Applied history isn't always in the limelight. It can be used to support the work of others. Historical content can form the part of artist briefs for the commissioning of public art, landscape designs and architectural competitions. History can inspire other forms of creative practice, such as literature, theatre, art, music and industrial design. The list can just go on. In this way, practitioners of applied history are facilitators. Or maybe we are history pushers, like drug pushers, but with a bit more of a positive community focus. <laughs> Historians are never passive beings. We are actively shaping the meanings, histories and memories of our local communities through applied history. It might be through a plaque, an exhibition, a banner, a hoarding on a construction site, a radio documentary or an artwork. Our work can be strategic, it can be controversial, but it can also be poetic. But most importantly, applied history can make a difference and enhance the well-being of our communities. Thank you.
you so much, Lisa. We've got time for one question. If anybody, had, I don't want you to feel like you've got to listen for the next hour or so. So, if anybody had a question for Lisa, no, no, you can take a seat then. Nice. Paul, would you like to come up yes. and tell us about applied history around the world? Paul, Paula and I had many discussions about the terms applied history and public history that we don't have time to discuss this afternoon, but it's an ongoing discussion that we can take into the future Absolutely. and that you can all contribute to as well. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I know a lot of faces in the audience today. Myth at the back. Midge from Law. Midge was going to do history, but she didn't get enough marks, so she's a associate professor of law now. Anyway, Lisa's cup reminded me of her story that Peter Reid told ages ago about a future about an optimist, a 99-year-old um, Dutchman who wrote a uh, letter to the local paper and said he was leaving the country because it didn't have a future. And for a 99-year-old to do that, you've got to be pretty optimistic. <laughs> OK, um, I'm going to use the term public history and applied history interchangeably here. Um, there's a lot of debates and a lot of theoretical and philosophical toings and froings around it, but I'll um, but it's a positive and interesting engagement I think we'll have in that. So the modern public or applied history movement has just entered its fifth decade and one could argue that public history and applied history is as old as the nation state but I won't go into that now. When it started public uh, history was defined primarily vis-a-vis -vis academic standards and practices and it was guided by a largely academic leadership from a relatively well-resourced traditionally, uh, traditional university sector. Times have moved on. Apart from the challenges of the digital world, university history departments have shrunk by and large and their relevance has been questioned in the global environment that has seen academic capitalism propel many universities into the last phase of corporatisation. The new environment has forced many in the academy in humanities, social sciences and the arts to think more about the reach, impact and social benefit of their work rather than talking primarily to themselves or disseminating their work to limited or specialist audiences. Engaged community based rather than a loose scholarship has been a significant factor in the recent rise in public history and applied history programs, for example in Britain such as the master's program at the University of York, which has a significant placement module. Engaged scholarship and the triple bottom line, an accounting framework which includes social and economic as well as financial factors to enhance brand and business value, is already affecting the relationship between public and academic history and communities outside the academy. Um, I'm particularly aware of this. I was director of the UTS Shopfront, some of you may have heard for a long time and that's um, a, a good uh, model of uh, engagement I think and there's good models here too as well. And these things will continue to do so in the future. The field is also going through a period of quite rapid internationalisation though there are still large obstacles preventing a holistic approach if that is possible to the public past or to the past um, in the present. The circumstances in which public historians operate vary, sometimes very dramatically, around the world. And we often forget this. Um, good to get on a plane and go and, <coughs> and visit places. Um, for example, an international seminar on public history was run jointly by the Department of History in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Indonesia, and it was also by the Centre for Public History at UTS. Uh, at the um, FIBU campus in Depok in Indonesia in September 2012. But public history's future in Indonesia is likely to be turbid negotiation between state, state, sorry, state sanctioned or sponsored accounts of the past and more democratic forms of history. While a 50 year old law allowing the government to ban books uh, considered able to disrupt public order was lifted in 2010. Official archives are still generally inaccessible and there is a lingering fear, a very real fear, palpable indeed, um, of challenging official histories in the wake of the collapse of the repressive new social order regime in 1999. During the regime, many intellectuals were imprisoned for challenging the Indonesian status quo, Indonesian status quo and there were island, prison islands that novelists and intellectuals and other people, historians, were dumped on for very long periods of time. 
China has also recently seen the development of public history programs and projects, but there too, civil dialogues are still at peril. Uh, the greatest fear of a colleague of Paula and mine, uh, that she spoke about when she was visiting us at UTS a number of years ago, um, uh, sorry, uh, w was the possibility of being imprisoned for long periods of time for questioning official narratives about the past and the past in the present. And there are, as we know, quite a number of academics in China be, uh, have been locked up for questioning the state. On a brighter note, in India, a Centre for Public History was established in 2011 at the Shirishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology in Bangalore, led by Indira Gaudry. And it is engaging very, in very interesting ways with a range of public history practices, including oral history, without the intervention at this time of the state. Public history is also being taught in the Department of History and Ethnography at Missouri University, and I visited there at the beginning of last year and taught for a couple of weeks. It was very interesting, but I won't go into that here. But hopefully the future will see the emergence of new international partnerships, projects and transnational perspectives on public history. This has been facilitated, among other things, by the International Federation for Public History, which was established in 2010. Public history's reception <coughs> by the British Academy has in general been more in accord with the North American experience, the so-called home of the modern uh, public history movement or applied history movement. And I don't know if any of you have been to a National Council on Public History conferences, but there are more and more international perspectives, but they are still very centred on North America. Um, and it's a, a, a big problem in the historiography. Um, in Britain, uh, an academic conference held at Trinity College, Cambridge in 2001 to mark the 40th anniversary of the University of London, London's Institute of Historical Research took the theme, What is History Now? One contributor noted that, the mo that most of the recent explosive growth in history has been the in popular taste and demand to which professional historians have contributed little and responded hardly at all. But ultimately, academic historians were being held up at this particular meeting as having, quote, a certain obligation of guidance, even of leadership. Another contributor, however, conceded, quote, the necessity for historians to engage in and with what has been called with some imprecision, uh, admittedly, public or applied history. The absence of a chapter on public history or applied history in the collection reflected its then embryonic condition in Britain. Now, public history can be traced through history workshop movement and, and that sort of thing at a different trajectory to the, Ameri to the American model which has come through uh, blue collar programs in various um, in, um, tertiary institutions. But the, the modern movement is in one sense only just emerging now and it's emerging very rapidly uh, in Britain. The Historical Association in Britain, for example, did not establish a public history committee until 2009. Uh, Ruskin College, where Hilda Keane teaches, and I think she visited Macquarie a little while ago, um, it was probably the first a big move for public history in Britain. Public history has taken different forms in different countries. Kaya Media, a company specially in New Media, which undertook commissioned histories, began in Italy in the 1980s. Uh, Peppino Orta Levi of Clear Media was employed as a consultant by UTS to advise on the establishment of a master's program which began in 1988. The Royal Netherlands Institute of South East Asian and Caribbean Studies was conducting public and applied history work among other things around memory and post-colonialism in Indonesia and the Dutch Caribbean. Some folklorists in countries including Finland and Sweden identified with applied and public history and centres dedicated to memorialisation, such as the Netherlands Institute for War Documentation, mushroomed across the world. Public and applied history was also blended into progressive museums, archival and heritage programs and practices across uh, the globe. Uh, these are areas in which many public historians work and a broad range of tertiary courses have developed in numerous universities, such as the University of Amsterdam, um, the University of Hamburg, 
uh, uh, Monash University in Australia and the University of Western Cape in South Africa. But in places talking about the particularities of place, um, uh, South Africa at the moment, uh, universities, are being, their funding's been decimated and a lot of these programs are in trouble. Um, these facilitated the movement of public historians into cultural institutions, government agencies, consultancies, and very importantly, I think, teaching, which is a highly public form of historical work and one which some freelancers engage in, but which is often overlooked as a, as a part of applied and public history practice. Graham Davidson has argued that the early use of the term public or applied history was in part an attempt to unite these diverse and widespread activities, particularly between academic and non-academic uh, practitioners, to, to unite these diverse and widespread activities and provide them with a sense of, he said, professional dignity. But instead it fueled a seemingly endless debate over the definition of public or applied history across the world. Lud Miller Jordanava, however, has rightly observed that, and I'll finish by quoting her, whatever the complexities of, pub of public, public history is a useful label in that it draws attention to the phenomena relevant to the discipline of history, but too rarely discussed in undergraduate courses. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Pleasure. And we have a time for a question, if anybody's got one. Questions. No, marvellous. It's okay. nice and clean. Yeah, Thank you. They come later. Paula. Thank you. And Paula's going to be talking to us about who is a public historian. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Lovely to see you all here. Um, well, in one sense, we're all public historians. <laughs> um, if you're engaged in the business of making history or um, talking to people about history or working on history, um, you know, you're a public historian, but, uh, and teaching history. Um, but, in, you know, we don't want to make it a useless term. So I'll just, I'll just start off um, by talking about one of Sebastian Barry, who's a brilliant novelist, um, early novels called The Secret Scripture. And a character towards the end of this novel says, um, I'm beginning to wonder strongly, what is the nature of history? Is it only memory in decent sentences? And if so, how reliable is it? I would suggest not very, and that therefore most truth and fact offered by these syntactical means, isn't he beautiful, um, <laughs> is treacherous and unreliable. And yet I recognise that we live our lives and even keep our sanity by the lights of this tre treachery and unreliability. Beautiful stuff. And here are all the themes of my professional life in one elegant paragraph. <laughs> the integral relationship between history and memory, uh, one claimed as more authoritative than another, um, but the truth uh, may be equally provisional um, and just as contingent. Nevertheless, the traces of the past are all we have to live with, um, to imagine ourselves from a past to a future. And a novelist, not a historian, is giving the gift to a reader like me of poetic truth. So these are some of the things that I have learned over many years as both a scholar and a public historian. No contradiction. <laughs> right? <laughs> I guess it will be clear that doing public history over this time, over a long time, um, from the late 1980s, has had profound consequences for my understanding of history as a discipline, uh, for the practice of history and historical understanding, my, uh, my understanding of a concept um, of historical consciousness, if you like, or living in time. Um, and as a result, working in this field, I feel a much stronger commitment to a broader participatory historical culture and um, working to try and promote historical intelligibility as part of that engagement. So who's a public historian? Um, as Paul's indicated very clearly, there are huge problems with defining public and applied history. Um, 
Applied history was actually a term used by the early practitioners, but they both have difficulties because as a descriptor for history, it's, um, you know, you, you assume, you know, if it's public history, is the rest of what people do private? <laughs> is what scholars do private history or personal history? No, of course not. Um, applied is what, is, if, if you're not an applied historian, are you then a theoretical historian if you write history <laughs> only for other scholars? So you can see, <laughs> you can see where the difficulty in definition <coughs> lies. Um, so at first, if, if you first you started off with, oh, it's history not practised in, you know, in only, that only <laughs> speaks to academics, then you're defining it by something that's negative. <laughs> so, and so it goes on, right? There's a huge kind of... Um, so there's a lot of edifice that they've tried to create to make this a proper area of studies. As, as you would know, anyone who's been involved in researching a new area of study knows that it's the emergence of journals, it's blogs, etc., etc. It's, it's the whole professional um, infrastructure that's been developing over this time and Tanya and the centre has now come in at a time where it's pretty well established really. It's even available in Russia <laughs> under Putin. So um, in a way both applied and public history as terms um, uh, continue to be inadequate but they're all you know they're all at the moment that we've got. Um, but particularly because the field is now so broad um, and its purposes have diversified, as we've already seen from Lisa and Paul. Um, and these narrow definitions also oversimplify relationships between historians and, and it's interesting that the Dean commented on this, clients, some people call them collaborators, some people call them audiences, media people often, um, some people call them publics, <laughs> and even the distinction between maker and user is becoming blurred. Paul and I often used to say that we're actually just um, content providers, really. <laughs> um, uh, now, what people tried to do at first uh, was say things like, oh, public historians are people who don't get to choose their own historical topic, right? Well, that isn't the case anymore. What, uh, some public historians working in cultural institutions like museums or national parks do choose their own historical stu subjects in conjunction with others um, and present new research. It's not, re it's not re you know, simply dumbed down academic work. Um, sometimes engaging with scholars in the process and sometimes not. Um, Others in the academy move in and out at various times, as I used to do, to work on projects, sometimes for an extended period of time with various publics. Because you can't teach public history without doing it. Like it's like, you know, teaching journalism or teaching, you know, you've got to be, a, you've got to do history. <laughs> um, so, um, and in, in addition, some people see public history as a livelihood and other people see it as a vocation. So it's a completely different understanding. And we live with these very different and quite diverse, richly diverse ways of thinking about it. Um, some, as Lisa does, earn a living from it. Some people take on commission projects and <laughs> run a small business. And there's quite a few of them in Australia um, very well established in the United States, as you would as you would imagine. Others feel that assisting communities to do their histories through various forms of advocacy is a rewarding political work, though it's often very poorly paid. So, for example, one of our students became a special Kate Waters became a specialist uh, working with Indigenous communities and Indigenous land rights. Uh, and helping, you know, research historical land rights. Well, it doesn't make a lot of money, but um, it makes enough for a living. Um, and she's a brilliant specialist in that area. Um, so, you know, Paul has already indicated about the emergence of public history as, as, as the emerging as the professionalisation in universities from the 1970s in many English-speaking countries. Um, and it's 
Um, Lisa talked about the way in which history is central to, the, to heritage. Um, and these trends that were emerging um, in the, in, were accelerated in the post-war period with the emergence of training courses for heritage professionals and the field of museology. Um, so from the 1980s, what you've got is not simply public history courses, you also see the emergence of courses in museology and heritage studies uh, in universities. So public history is a broader umbrella, but it's not the only kind of course. You can do course in archives and um, various areas in which you would be able to use history. Um, these courses, um, as these as, as the ones that are being set up here, meet a need for more specialist <coughs> knowledge and create a marketplace where history is valued. Um, so how do you then understand what public historians do? Some see it as a process of translation, some of mediation, some of popularisation. And indeed, you might do a range of those things. Um, um, now, from the academic side, um, from the scholar's side, um, there's huge buzzwords at the moment in um, the academy, and Macquarie is no exception, about uh, notions of engagement and impact, right? And um, it's become central to so many aspects of academic life, not only at the individual level of writing ARC grants, um, um, nobody ever asked the question about how the impact, how the Australian Research Council shapes Australian research, <laughs> but it does, and it's and it's not always a good thing. Um, um, but at the level, so on the one hand, we know that at the individual level, we've got to demonstrate that our research has impact, um, that we're engaging, um, and at at one level. I can see that this is fair enough, that universities have become accountable. Um, we need to show that we're doing research that benefits people. You know, I, I can't argue with that and wouldn't. At another, I worry that the shaping of research, it shapes research into an instrumentalist approach to historical, to forms of historical problems, um, which actually affects the kind of area, choice and uh, approach and methodology. Um, but that might be the legacy of a blue sky girl in theory. Okay, so public history has, has flourished in the 21st century and it's partly impelled by this need for engagement and impact. Um, in, as Paul said in Britain, the conservative government higher education policies, um, you know, has put in higher education policies that recognise social or community impact as a component of university funding. Uh, it's not the most, but it's they're raising it and it's coming here. Um, doing public history has become one of the popular means by which universities' humanities scholars can demonstrate community engagement. So um, one, one English academic talked about uh, the way historians must be able to show um, how their research benefits society and to rebuild their role as enlightened sceptics in the knowledge economy. Now, that is one way, I guess, you can do engagement. You can be an historian who delivers <laughs> out there <laughs> to um, help others. Um, the prime example in, the, in England is the policy and history site, website, um, where academics um, try and make their research useful by, um, you know, working on things that underpin policy. Um, and David Lowe has set up a, a similar site here in Australia where you can actually go and if your research, if research is relevant, um, you can give historical background and that's part of people assuming that they're, you know, or hoping that their historical research can be useful. But it's only one way <laughs> to reach out, it's outreach from the academy. Um, it's not necessarily operating as a public historian in a broader sense. Um, 
The public history community lists a vast number of diverse professionals, including consultants, historians in the government, you know, you've heard all this, museum curators, national park staff, heritage interpreters, local and community historians. So there's also a lot of people working not in the academy who are public historians, who engage backwards and forwards <coughs> with it, or don't, as the case may be. Um, the, the academy is always the elephant in the room, <laughs> partly because for a long time public history, applied history, was regarded as second rate. So what academics assumed was, if you didn't have what it took to be a scholar, then um, you did public history. That's changed quite significantly. But there was a lot of hostility in university departments all around the United States to the emergence of public historians. Um, and um, you know that old saying, those who can research, those who can't teach. Um, well, you know, this <laughs> um, arrogant scholars who assumed that um, there were jobs for all history graduates, if you were smart enough <laughs> in academe, um, that was the situation, that was their situation. If you were really smart, you'd get a job. Well, there aren't any jobs anymore. <laughs> and so um, history departments themselves have now realised that they need to change. And that's a result of a confluence of um, factors. Um, so um, I think it's important to raise the issue rather than tread around it. You know, why? Um, because there is a, when I first started engaging with um, public historians, and particularly in the United States, there was a lot of um, defensiveness about the profession. And it was because they were looked down on by academics. Um, so, uh, or other academics, if they happened to be teaching public history. So I think you need to be aware of that aspect of the history as well. Um, and say that I think it's important to recognise boundaries between professional historical scholarship and other participatory paths to the past with those boundaries as zones of engagement, not the means of exclusion. And that's the critical point. Um, of course historians have pushed the boundaries many times. And um, of course there is a long history of scholarly historians having civic engagement. Um, it's just that this is much more about a professional kind of training and working outside academe, doing a great deal of other things. Um, and lately, one of the reasons history departments have had to change is because the landscape has changed. The people who read, listen, consume, as well as make history has changed irrevocably. Um, it's a vast domain history making, um, practiced by millions of people around the world. And it's meant that while the definition debate that's ongoing about public history or applied history keeps going, it used to be what work did the historian do? Now it is about how can we engage with audiences? So it's shifted from this, from, from this to the impact, the question of communicability. How do we communicate our work? Um, and the question of audience. And that's become really central. And it's actually meant that historians have more fruitfully engaged with, if you like, with media, radio, TV, etc. So if you ask the questions, who's going to read this book? <laughs> who's going to read this website? Who's going to listen to this pod, uh, podcast? Um, um, you know, they're the kinds of questions you need to ask about your historical work. Um, if you tell academic historians that the, the scholarly book that you're writing is going to be read by 200 people, if you are lucky, <laughs> um, they don't like it very much. But they have a right to speak to small audiences, even though What's changed now is that they don't speak only to that audience anymore. They speak to a range of audiences. Um, even for 
our research councils and things. We have to indicate how can the research have impact, how can it be more widely circulated. So there is, there is an important issue in who is the audience for your research. It's like a novelist writing just for themselves, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so that landscape has now changed. Um, and so it's more about what's the public or what's the applied in public history rather than what role the public, who is the public historian. Um, public history can provide new knowledge, new ways of seeing things, and sometimes that happens through its transformation in different forms. So uh, this week I've judged a um, journalism oral history prize down at the University of Wollongong and we <coughs> gave the prize to an undergraduate who did this beautiful podcast and designed a website around it. And the actual form of it transformed how you listened and watched um, and helped you to understand um, history in that particular domain, uh, really in interesting ways. So the form that you choose to present your work in is important as well. Okay, so I won't go on. Um, what has come out of this is that the most contentious issues for public historians is the question of cultural authority and the nature of historical knowledge. In other words, in a, in a climate of complete democratisation, and this is also happening, of course, to many other professions, journalism is the obvious one, um, what is the role of expertise, right? If we learn to value other people's authority, historical authority, or historical authority in various areas of public history, like museums, right, or like um, filmmakers, historical filmmakers, or heritage practitioners, or even reenactors who are obsessed with accuracy because they don't have an institutional framework and the only way they can get authority is to do it accurately. If we are to respect their knowledge, then we have to ask questions about where it leaves us uh, as academic experts. So I th I'll, <laughs> I'll leave that with you. <laughs> That's for discussion. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, to the panellists, you, you were fantastic. Thank you so much. It gives us a kind of foundation for our discussions, either this afternoon or going forward into the future. You're welcome to move to that side if you want to. And can I get the team who will be speaking to the various projects um, that we are working on over the next few uh, months and years to come up here and we'll present some of the projects we'll be working on. Would you want us to? Yes. Would you want us? Yeah, just stop. Oh. Yeah, so that way you don't kind of keep coming up there. Colleagues, uh, I'm going to chair this next little section, and I'll take the chair's prerogative to. Um, Common an observation that I made in Denver in minus 23 degrees temperatures um, a little while ago, uh, well in January, and that was I was looking at the last British research exercise, the ranking system, the league tables around research. The number third ranked history department in the UK in the last RAE or whatever it's now been called was the University of Hertfordshire. I didn't even know there was a University of Hertfordshire. Um, but I do know someone that taught there, a guy called Peter DeSena, who works in um, the teaching and learning of history. And I said, how did you do it? And he said, engagement and impact. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, of course, uh, my colleagues in the 2-1 era code will know that in the last week or two I've been badgering them uh, around uh, completing a survey around engagement because uh, e uh, the ERA has decided the 2-1 code will be used to trial how we might measure or think about engagement. And so we're doing that using the last ERA rounds data, uh, 2008 to 2013. Um, so I thought it was really interesting how um, Peter just said that's what made the difference for them. They, a 12-person department, how does a 12... 
person department in the UK when most history departments in the UK are 40 to 50 mm. do it. Um, and it was all about their very, very proactive way of engaging with the broader community and demonstrating their impact. And I hope um, that this centre will, will assist history at Macquarie. Uh, and of course, in the 2-1 code, it doesn't matter whether you're an ancient historian or modern historian, uh, we all survive together. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the projects that the centre is jumping into. So the, the great thing I think about the centre and the work that's already been done is we're hitting the ground running and there's a number of uh, opportunities and projects and I think Tanya will mention towards the end, you know, these hopefully will encourage you to think about the ways that you can engage with the centre um, going forward. So first we've got um, Tanya going to share one of her projects relating to families. Thank you very much, Sean, and thanks for the department's support as well at the centre. Um, okay, so many of you who know me will know that I've been working on family history for quite some time. Um, and I began a collaboration with uh, the ADB, the Australian Dictionary of Biography, and ANU back in 2014 with Ancestry.com. Um, historians struggle to find industry partners, but thankfully family history has Ancestry, the big behemoth of a company, global company. Um, and uh, that partnership has paid off in all sorts of ways. Um, and I diligently apply for my ALC funding each and every year to fund a family history research project, but I thought I'd go straight to the, uh, the top dogs here, and I went to Ancestry, uh, to help fund um, a symposium that I'd had in mind for quite some time, um, that I'm co-organising with Jerome de Groot. Those of you who work in public history will know Jerome's excellent scholarship on public history, based at the University of Manchester. He's actually a literary scholar, but a fantastic public historian. And uh, I met with him in Manchester earlier this year and we're set on working towards this big international symposium on global history and DNA um, in the hope that I will now understand what all that DNA stuff is about. Um, so we are going to be inviting lots of international scholars, diverse interdisciplinary scholars, biologists as well as historians and others to this symposium in Manchester. Um, and uh, Professor Alison Light, many of you I hope will have read her wonderful Common People. Uh, she will be giving the keynote lecture at that, which I'm desperately excited about because we couldn't persuade her to come out here, unfortunately. Um, some years ago. Uh, I'm still working with the ADB and ANU um, and Ancestry as well and we're uh, going to be organising a national symposium in Australia later this year as well. So for those of you, and I know there's students here working on family history, please kind of uh, be aware of these um, moments and get involved. Some of you have already have um, got in touch and come on board as, a, as um, associate members of the centre but please do get in touch if you want to be involved in other ways. Thanks very much. Okay, and uh, our next speaker is Jane, who of course many of you will know as the manager of uh, the Australian History Museum in the Department of Modern History, Politics and International Relations. Okay, thanks. Um, so obviously being in the museum, we're very much in the applied history wheelhouse, um, but the, the project that I'm going to talk to today is our dementia program, and we run it in collaboration with Rhonda Davis from the Art Gallery. Um, and it's definitely one of my most favourite programs that we do. It's um, very nice, makes you feel very warm and fuzzy inside. Um, but it, we've also kind of learnt that we're getting all this amazing anecdotal stories and, and oral histories that are coming out of it. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't kind of think that you'd get this from a group of people <laughs> suffering from dementia. Um, but it, it's amazing what's happening. We're, you know, we're bringing out objects from the museum and we're looking at art from the gallery and that we're getting these amazing stories from people as if you know it was just yesterday and and we need to work out how we're going to capture this and where it sits in the spectrum of history and and how we can use it so thankfully it's going to be part of the center and and that's what we'll focus on moving forward and we'll look at how we can expand the project um, get it into galleries out, outside of our area um, and then hopefully utilise a whole range of information that comes from it. So that's basically the, the dementia therapy program that we're working on. Uh, those of you who came to the Jill Rowe event on Monday will recall I talked a little bit about my honours year. Um, and one of the things I did was in fact write an essay on about how would, great it would be for students to go to nursing homes and talk to elderly people uh, about their past. Um, and the essay was in a historiography course that was um, run by Professor Patrick O'Farrell, 
who, who gave me a HD for the essay, but the first thing he wrote was, this smacks of totalitarian mind control. <laughs> um, but it's good to see 30 years later, um, these, these ideas are, are being explored. Uh, we're back to Tanya now to, to share another really exciting project. Well, this is a project that comes from Paul um, and our other external collaborators as well. But also we've got lots of partnerships with the History Council of New South Wales, uh, with the uh, Dictionary of Sydney, uh, with the State Library of New South Wales as well, and with a whole uh, a broad ranging public libraries network as well. Um, so this is uh, plans to kind of build on the Dictionary of Sydney model to create an encyclopedia of New South Wales. Um, this will have obviously a huge kind of research impact, but will also result in the co-creation of knowledge as well in all sorts of ways bringing in diverse communities, local historians, family historians, but also be a really important student project for us that would help expand our PACE, our professional and community engagement program, our undergraduate program here at Macquarie, but also internships at the Masters of Research level as well. And um, Andrew Metcalf is here as well from New South, and we've just put a call out today in the library's network of Australia um, newsletter um, asking people all over New South Wales to dig out the diaries in their attics and their parents' attics and their grandparents' attics because we're trying to create an archive of diaries um, written by ordinary people uh, not for a public audience so that is going to be part of this project as well that is super exciting um, we're hoping we're going to create our own little kind of mass observation um, minefield for future researchers in that process. Oh. Speaking of which, um, sorry, I, I shifted my slides at the last minute, uh, which one should never do. Um, so this speaks again um, to um, a key focus of the university, Macquarie University, around employability and internships. Um, so part of the PACE programme and Masters of Research programme is trying to develop the transferable skills of our students um, to recognise that there aren't uh, a plethora of jobs in academia for our research students to be working towards, uh, but recognising that but also helping to develop transferable skills that could be used in all sorts of areas. Um, and um, the internship um, programme is part of that. But it's not just about employability <coughs> and finding jobs, it's also about trying to develop active citizenship as well and to get students to kind of engage with that. And so we're gathering lots of data on the ways in which students are developing um, those sorts of, that sort of awareness as well in the process. Thanks, Tanya. And uh, last Friday I was at um, the Cronulla Leagues Club, their 50th anniversary, uh, the Mighty Sharks. Uh, and just, a f just this morning I was at Kincopple Rose Bay, which is celebrating its 135th, and in both, both cases they were very keen to engage with um, Macquarie student interns. So if there's anyone, um, Ezra MRS students, first year looking for an internship opportunity, um, speak to Tanya. Uh, and now Sean's going to talk a little bit around um, a project that shows the ways in which ancient history is an important player here with the centre. Well, first I'd like to thank Tanya when she conceived of this center of, of uh, casting it broadly enough that, uh, that she could include people like me, although I'm a bit of a, a fraud. I'm actually, I am actually a historian trained as a pre-classical uh, ancient, uh, ancient historian. As, someone mentioned, as, as uh, someone mentioned earlier, it's what grants you win that eventually drive your career. And so instead of being a, Ho a Homeric historian, now I'm a digital archaeologist. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, I'd just like to thank Tony for really casting it widely, this uh, center widely enough that it could include a bunch of the cultural heritage work that we're uh, doing, not only in ancient history, much of this is, as you'll see, is in cooperation with modern history, um, but that it does include some of our uh, ancient history cultural heritage work. Um, the f uh, first, I'll start with one, a project that isn't, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that um, uh, I'm not directly involved in. Um, but uh, that I wanted to uh, I wanted to highlight, um, and that's uh, um, there's a number of people in uh, ancient history are working in Egypt and other areas of the world where cultural heritage is under serious threat of actual destruction in, in very dramatic ways, as any as many of you would see. And uh, one of the major ones is at the Beni Hassan tombs, some Middle Kingdom tombs, uh, about four thousand years old in uh, uh, in Egypt, um, to uh, comprehensively record. Um, these tombs because they are considered under under threat and this is something that the um, uh, that um, the leaders of that project uh, the Egyptian Ministry of Culture are very committed to and uh, the, I was hoping that maybe this would be settled by now it's not quite we may have even some major corporate sponsorship for that uh, that we should know about in the next uh, in the next few months 
Um, so that, in a way, is sort of a very uh, a, a, a traditional art historical, archaeological sort of material culture thing, but that has uh, taken on new importance in the uh, um, in, in in light of uh, contemporary events in that part of the world. Um, my own research and uh, and uh, the other, my my team is also in a way kind of conventional archaeology, conventional uh, uh, cultural history. Uh, we do we have a large landscape archaeology project in modern uh, in in what's now Bulgaria um, that uh, suffers from uh, uh, significant problems with looting, development, other things that are a threat to the heritage. So in addition to our sort of pure you know research that we do, um, we look at uh, we. Uh, um, uh, new, you know, taking the data that we get from landscape archaeology and uh, um, uh, assessing it in ways that allow the local museums, who are our partners on um, uh, uh, in this uh, in this work, uh, and in the funding that we get to uh, assess threats and uh, and address them with the very limited resources that they have available to them in Bulgaria, which is kind of a you know middle income uh, uh, emerging uh, uh, emerging country. Um, so. This work then, interestingly, uh, grew, what grew out of that is uh, um, a large digital heritage and archaeology project uh, that's now based here at, uh, at, at Macquarie, and that's probably where we have the most uh, connections with um, what Tanya is um, uh, proposing. Um, so this is a, it's an infrastructure project. Uh, we've had an ARC grant, we've had some other major grants uh, for, for this one, and we've got a number of things going on, but it's basically you know, developing digital tools for different stages of, um, uh, of, of uh, archaeological research and heritage management from the beginning. So uh, this slide, just to remind me, to uh, uh, from the beginning when um, people are out doing archaeological research, uh, it, uh, helping with the digital um, uh, capture of that. So um, we support, for instance, here, this is uh, from the Lake Mungo project, uh, where they've got adapted a, uh, based out of La Trobe University, where they've adapted an entirely digital workflow for all of their uh, uh, data capture, which gives us a much richer picture. Um, you find that you have to be very selective when you record things on, on, on paper, but when you uh, adopt some of these newer pro uh, approaches, it gives a, very, a, a much richer picture of the heritage. Um, I picked that one out, and another one with our partners at the University of Queensland, um, where uh, they, under the auspices of our project, they've developed a portal that um, mines all of the data out of the heritage registries in um, uh, Queensland. Right now, it's Queensland, Victoria, and some of the heritage registries in South Australia, and represents that in a way that's much more accessible to the public and, uh, and much more useful for researchers um, as well. And we're hoping to continue uh, continue that project. Growing out of this, so here I am, you know, you, you know, Greek archaeo Greek historian, Greek archaeologist. How do I? You know, this is this was my uh, uh, pathway into uh, work in uh, Australia, and uh, so one of the major projects that we're working on this year, uh, that will actually, will be led by Tanya, is. Um, a uh, landscape archaeology and uh, local history project of uh, the mining communities uh, in the Jameson Valley around uh, Katoomba. Um, and uh, we've already got partners lined up for a linkage project uh, there with uh, Scenic World, the uh, um, uh, Blue Mountains World Heritage Center, and a number of other um, uh, uh, partners there. So a um, lot of things going on, and, and it was just it was very generous of Tanya to invite uh, her colleagues upstairs in ancient history to, uh, to, to join, and we're really looking forward to uh, pursuing this collaboration further. So just some of the examples of the work that we're already um, engaging in uh, through the centre, and again, hopefully um, these might form a, as a pump primer for you to think about your own projects and look forward to that engagement. Um, and as um, Tanya and the website mentions, we're you know, very much also interested, especially engaging with um, professional historians and professional historians association and, and building those relationships. Um, we certainly don't want to be seen as usurpers of, the, um, of professional historians out there in the public space. Uh, while we're still in plenary, um, we can open up for a few comments or observations or opinions. If not, Tanya is famous for her baked goods. Um, and so we'll more, move to a I more... I my impact and significance. <laughs> <laughs> we will move to a more informal mode of um, discussion and enjoyment of said baked treats. 
Um, so can you thank everyone for being here today, and especially to Tanya for all.